Welcome to everyone who joined us today for this eight World Data System webinar. Um, first of all, I would like confirmation that all participants can hear the audio broadcast. Uh, please use the chat window to indicate if you're getting the audio signal correctly. Okay, thanks Marcus for the confirmation. So welcome to everyone for this uh, eight webinar on crowdsourcing data and quality control, the experience of OpenStreetMap. We are very fortunate today to have two presenters with us. Mikael Maron, a founding member of the OpenStreetMap Foundation, the nonprofit foundation which supports and enables the development of freely reusable geospatial data and which is closely connected with the OpenStreetMap project. Mikael is also the co-founder of the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team. He has recently joined Mapbox, a company providing also a mapping platform for developers. Um, our second presenter is Paola Kim Blanco. She's a senior staff associate at the Center for International Earth Science Information Network, known uh, as CISIN and um, it's hosted in the Earth Institute at Columbia University. She's involved with Global Roads Open Access Datasets, which is um, available via the NASA Socioeconomic Data and Application Center, CDAC, hosted by CISIN, and also a member of the ICSO World Data System. So I'm very happy to welcome both of you today to present um, this eight webinar. Um, first, Mikael will give us um, a few 15 minutes presentation, and this will be followed by another 15 minute presentation by Paola. And we will take, a, after the two presentations, questions from um, uh, participants who are listening to the webinar via the question and answers panel. So if you have any questions, please feel free to type them um, as they come and we will address these questions sequentially at the end of the presentations. So please locate the question and answer panel and feel free to add them uh, during the presentations. So now, Mikael, I'm making you a presenter and the floor is Great. yours for your first uh, presentation, for the first presentation. Cool, thanks very much. Hello everyone. I'm uh, going to start with a little background on OpenStreetMap in case you're not familiar with it. It's a free and open map of the entire world. Um, anyone can contribute. Anyone can use the data. Uh, the focus is on base map data. So this is roads, infrastructure, buildings, land use, uh, natural features, anything that's kind of contextual base map data uh, along the lines of what you would see in um, Google Maps. And we often call, um, think of ourselves or talk about ourselves as the Wikipedia of maps because the model of how we create OpenStreetMaps is very similar. And while the data in OpenStreetMap is excellent, high quality, incredibly useful, used by governments, by companies, by uh, nonprofits in humanitarian response, um, we our focus always is on the people. Um, OpenStreetMap is a community of people who are incredibly passionate about geographic data who care very much about the map. Uh, we have um, connections online and offline. Um, it's a very um, integrated and dense community. Basically, we create data in a few ways. Um, a lot of data is created by digitizing satellite imagery like this, taking imagery like this, tracing it um, to create map data like this. There's our roads and buildings. Um, features, amenities, um, but it's really driven by uh, local mappers who understand what's on the ground and who also are collecting data on the ground using GPS units, using mobile phones, using um, here um, field papers, which is a way to kind of a paper-based GPS, and um, they have the local context. They know what's on the ground, and um, ultimately the, the people who are in it, any place are the greatest experts. Um, in OpenStreetMap. And when um, we say on the ground, we mean absolutely everywhere. 
this is one of the mappers from the Map Kibera project, uh, which I co-founded. Uh, Kibera is a, a large slum in Nairobi, Kenya, where um, young people since 2009 have been part of the OpenStreetMap community, contributing map data and making it useful for uh, their local community, all in the same database, all on the same playing field as someone sitting in an office here in Washington, D.C. Uh, we use uh, tools like the, hot, the OSM Tasking Manager for coordinating our work. Um, in a lot of places, uh, this takes an area of interest, divides it into, um, sub, into a grid, into sub-squares, which individuals can, um, can lock, focus their energy, and then um, confirm that it's done, leaving it up for someone else to do validation. Um, to do a double check on what they've done. So tools like this help us um, rapidly create data, especially in times of crisis. And um, it's important for, um, for the world to have a tool like OpenStreetMap. As we know, the, uh, we're, we're urbanizing incredibly quickly. And um, from what I've seen, this model is, is the one that's best suited to rapidly creating um, data on pace with the way our world is changing. This is a, a just a, all of the OpenStreetMap data that's been created in Dar es Salaam over the last year. Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team was working with the World Bank there to collect data for um, flood prevention, among other issues. And this is a, <clears throat> an incredibly, incredibly uh, dense map, every single structure in the city, which has largely been growing informally. Um, has been mapped along with tons of amenities and roads. It's important in places in crisis. In um, almost a year ago in Nepal, uh, with, there was a, a massive earthquake, as we all remember. And uniquely, uh, we had a very strong local presence in Kathmandu. OpenStreetMap and the hot community did in Kathmandu Living Labs, who had grown out of um, previous work there. They led the response and helped create maps like the one on the left, which was produced by the Canadian Armed Forces. They were the, the, the nexus coordinating the OpenStreetMap community and the international humanitarian response. And um, this, is, uh, this is Jakarta, where the local government has been working with OpenStreetMap and HOT to um, be prepared for, for flooding, for, uh, for planning. One of the first questions anyone asks when they hear about OpenStreetMap is, well, how do I talk to OpenStreetMap? Where's the front door? I'm on the board, again, of the OpenStreetMap Foundation, um, but we're entirely volunteer um, at the moment. Um, this is our global headquarters. We're a virtual organization. Um, and so <clears throat> it can be confusing for, for other organizations who want to um, want to officially talk to OpenStreetMap. Um, there are no, the thing is there's a network of many organizations which are working in the OpenStreetMap community. Um, I've mentioned HOT a couple times. Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team is a nonprofit um, <clears throat> based here in D.C., but with folks around the world. And within the community of humanitarian response, it serves as sort of the, the API, the nexus to the OpenStreetMap community. <clears throat> Last year, I was a fellow at the U.S. State Department, a Presidential Innovation Fellow, <clears throat> and increasingly we saw, uh, I saw um, government entities in the U.S. government and other governments um, taking on a strong organizational role in OpenStreetMap. These are a few um, pictures from the White House Mapathon from last year, which brought together people to actually do something um, at the White House uh, together, which is Often, uh, often the case there's a lot of talking, but it was very refreshing to get together and actually do um, mapping. That and other um, work led to a commitment by the U.S. government to open mapping in its Open Government Partnership Plan. Uh, open Government Partnership is a, a, a voluntary um, commitment by almost 80 countries around the world um, to all sorts of open government work. And open mapping is, uh, is a part of what the U.S. government does from the work of the Peace Corps, the State Department, USAID, and also domestically focused agencies like the National Park Service and USGS. So we're hoping to see more of, of that in other countries um, 
uh, commitments to open government. That in particular has led to all sorts of unique uh, collaborations. Um, these young women are from Ramallah, Palestine. They worked uh, with a local NGO there called Suktel. We partnered with the Jerusalem Consulate to map for Ebola. And you see some of the results there on the left. That's a, um, an IRC an Red Cross map of Kanema, Sierra Leone. Um, so this is uh, this is the kinds of connections which happen every day in the open street map community, where you have people from young women from Palestine mapping for Ebola. It's not the it's not the story that we normally hear about these places. And here's uh, just a, a little bit of the before and after work from the Ebola response, in which um, HOD and OpenStreetMap were were critical um, to provide base map data for logistics and um, and uh, contact tracing. So analysis. Um, the first or second question uh, folks will ask about OpenStreetMap is how, how the heck do you keep um, high quality data in OpenStreetMap when anyone can uh, create data? And <clears throat> again, it comes back to the people. Um, OpenStreetMap is incredibly passionate. People spend a lot of time and effort and investment in, uh, in OpenStreetMap and they take ownership of their place and make sure that the data that is coming in is high quality. This is visible to everyone. So everyone has access to seeing what is, what is changing um, and via that anyone can um, discuss and make sure that what comes in is high quality. And, and through that process, um, by, by and large, um, uh, things are kept on track. <clears throat> but the one thing I would say about the analysis tools is um, there's a lot of them. Uh, this is just a screenshot of our wiki page on, on um, quality um, control. And there's a lot of them. They're not necessarily well integrated into our main website. They're not necessarily accessible to new users or people who are not especially technical. They do the job very well. They, they are able to detect lots of um, issues and provide means of fixing them. But um, they're distributed all over the place. So I've recently started working at, at Mapbox, which is a, a company uh, which does a lot of work in the open source space, and a lot of its products are based on OpenStreetMap. And so Mapbox loves OpenStreetMap, is passionate about um, the quality of OpenStreetMap. And recently we've been um, looking at how can we um, uh, help to make tools for QA more accessible to, uh, to ourselves and to the broader community. So these have been a few of our guiding principles. We want any tools that we're using to be able to integrate into our workflow. We have um, people creating data. We have people analyzing and um, processing data for our other tools like our base map, um, geocoder, directions. Um, we want to make it very easy to add new analysis. This should be a very low bar for anyone to <clears throat> to take uh, take OpenStreetMap data and ask questions about it. That especially means um, lowering the bar so that you don't have to set up new databases. OpenStreetMap is a very big data. It's uh, kind of unwieldy, um, and um, a lot of time is just set up, spent setting up the database itself to run analysis. So um, we've been looking at that. We want something that can run as a library or on the command line, and, and something that's open source, which we can uh, build a, a shared community around. The first part of, of that has been um, OSM QA tiles. These are vector data tiles, um, tiles like, like map tiles that you, you, you would see, but they contain um, vector data, structured data, um, and contain all of OpenStreetMap pre-processed into tiles and also pre-processed into country extracts. So they're um, very, uh, they're small, they're easy to download and use. And uh, we have a tool called Tile Reduce. Uh, we have a library called Turf JS, which does spatial analysis in, in JavaScript, <coughs> which processes things like OSM QA tiles. And we recently did an analysis counting the lengths of roads per country in OpenStreetMap around the world, um, and then did a comparison against um, the road length numbers in the World Factbook, 
I think comes from the, the International Road Federation. Um, and by and large, OpenStreetMap was, at least the, the links were comparable to what's published in the fact book. 100% um, here for the U.S. does not mean that we have every road mapped. It just means that we have the same length of roads or greater than what's in the fact book. Um, the map is never done and new roads happen are, are coming all the time. Uh, but you can explore that, that um, yourself. There's a, there's a link at the end of the presentation. Um, for the analysis part, we put together a tool called OSM Lint, which builds off of all of these other libraries. <coughs> and um, this is what it looks like to use OSM Lint. On the command line, um, it's, it's just as simple as running OSM Lint, um, giving it the analysis you want to run. Bridge on node checks for um, a mistaken tag um, in OpenStreetMap. You give a, boom, uh, a bounding box and link to your downloaded um, OSM QA tiles, and it will output all of the errors in, um, in GeoJSON, which you can then take into a GIS or into another tool for visualization, further analysis, and action. Um, the second part there just shows you what it looks like to use it within Node.js, um, so it's um, also something that you can, you can write code with. The um, analysis themselves um, are pretty straightforward just to the real core of it is just, oh, I'm trying to write <laughs> this line here. Yeah, um, this is just saying if there's a bridge and it's a, it's a single point, um, then that's a problem because a bridge should be on a, on a line, um, then mark it as, a, as an issue. Um, so these can be very, very simple um, and easy to write. And they can be packaged into shell scripts like this, um, which runs a number of analysis, um, then posts the GeoJSON results, and then makes a call to Slack. Um, Slack is a collaboration tool we use a lot at Mapbox, and others use it a lot. And what this, this script here does is basically runs analysis and post the results to the Slack channel where team members can then check um, on the problems as they come up. And um, open it in our editors. This is the JOSM editor. So you go from um, an analysis is run, it's posted in, um, in a community chat, click, 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 you're editing OpenStreetMap and fixing it. Um, another example, I was asked the other day um, how many contributors were um, new to Mexico in 2015, how many new editors? Um, this turned out to be um, a pretty simple script to run, uh, right? This uh, here basically just counts the number of features um, in Mexico. And within about an hour, um, I was able to get a res uh, I wrote it, it took about an hour to like write and debug. It runs in a matter of seconds. Um, <clears throat> this stuff runs really fast. This ran like, like within uh, 10, 20 seconds. 3,664 new editors in Mexico, oh, editors total in Mexico in all time, 771 in 2015. So their community is growing fast. And there's a map of all the edits which were done by new people in 2015. So you see very, very active, that's Mexico City. Um, other people are taking up these tools. This is an analysis of road curviness in Italy. So just uh, calculating how um, how curvy the roads are using OSM QA tiles and tile reduce. And you can see the red are where is the curvier part and it uh, not surprisingly corresponds um, with, uh, with uh, the topography of Italy. Um, here's uh, some analysis of the Bangalore bus routes. Um, this one, I, this, we have a team in Bangalore at Mapbox and this is the longest bus route in Bangalore. It's, it's something like 120 kilometers and takes five hours in total. Um, they had open data and were able to analyze um, using, using the same tools. Um, and just the final word, we're also looking at vandalism. So this is intentional um, uh, bad data in OpenStreetMap. We're trying to, we're working actively to characterize and identify vandalism and put it using these same tools and um, Making this, making the results available to our data team, as well as the data working group within 
OpenStreetMap. This is uh, this is all open source, so we can all work and build this together. If it's interesting to you at all, very happy to talk about it um, after during the QA and, and afterwards. And I will I will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Mikhail, for for this great presentation. So um, so far, we have only two questions uh, pending in the Q and A. So maybe we'll take them very quickly, and then we'll we'll continue with Paula. So the first question from Mr. Kuti Kumar. Um, I think the answer will be short. Is OpenStreetMap freely available? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. It's open data. So and you can. There's lots of ways you can get OpenStreetMap data, and I'm happy to provide links to where you can download it in the format that you you need. Excellent. So we'll, um, we'll provide this information. Um, a second question from Leslie Beadle. Were you concerned by any areas that don't seem to be contributing to OpenStreetMap? Oh, yes, definitely. It's a concern. We want to help grow OpenStreetMap everywhere. Um, there's a need for maps everywhere, that's for sure. So um, there's been a lot of work to, ex to expand the community. Um, but it, as far as analysis goes, I think the thing we're, we're working on now and some of the Mexico analysis is actually leading towards that is can we analyze and identify exactly where we have active communities right now and where we don't. And um, that can then help us to guide community development activities, whether it's reaching out to new mappers or um, reaching back to old mappers who have um, become inactive, or whether it means we need to think about is there a way to partner with other organizations to bring mapping to new places. Um, so yeah, definitely a concern, and the analysis here is, is a key part of being able to react um, more, you know, more intelligently to gaps in the map in the community. Excellent. Thanks, Mikhail. Um, so we'll continue with Paola's presentation, and if you have more questions for uh, Mikhail, please enter them into the question and answer panel, and we will have another opportunity at the end uh, of the second presentation to recap other questions. Paola, um, your presenter, and the, the floor is yours for the second part. Yes, thank you. Um, so, uh, in this portion of the presentation, um, I will focus on validation work that, uh, of road features from OpenStreetMap conducted by me and by the graduate student, uh, Bogdan Mihai Kilnukia at CISEN, uh, Columbia University. So, our aim was to answer two specific questions. Um, how accurate and how complete is the OSM road data set in low-income countries? Ultimately, we wanted to get the overall sense of trustworthiness of OSM road in order to see whether we could or should incorporate uh, OSM roads into Global Roads version 2. So, um, Global Roads is an uh, open, open data product hosted by CDAC at Season, uh, which is a, basically a vector uh, layer of all the roads in the world. Uh, so we currently have version one. We would like to release version two by um, sometime in 2017. So we are now assessing uh, you know, the different data sources. Uh, so, as a first step, we conducted a review of the current literature on this topic to learn about previous validation and quality assessment work uh, done by other scholars. So, in summary, um, there is an extensive line of research that looks at way to assess the quality of volunteer geographic information, um, and OpenStreetMap has been used repeatedly as a case study. In terms of road features, uh, positional accuracy and completeness are among the most common quality parameters tested by other researchers. 
Uh, there are many other parameters to study um, as well. They include um, attributes and temporal accuracy, lineage, logistical consistency, uh, versioning, uh, contributors analysis, et cetera. Uh, but so we were mostly focused on uh, positional accuracy and completeness. In terms of completeness, um, authors such as Gears, Hackway, Grazer, Nees, and others have tested uh, completeness by comparing authoritative or proprietary data sets against OSM. Uh, and so most cases were reviewed at the national or, or other at the city level uh, and mostly from developed countries. Uh, where either these types of uh, benchmark data sets exist uh, and are reliable. Um, so the comparisons were done measuring road length of road density uh, in most cases. And in general, the results is tilted uh, favorably toward the OSM. <laughs> um, and although OSM broad features have been progressively added into the data set, database uh, aiming to complete uh, a special coverage, uh, there are some other authors that do mention the presence of some bias um, in terms of um, more focus towards urban areas. And this is completely understandable. There's more people. Uh, the demographics there favor uh, more integration, more use of uh, of the technology so that it's, it's just easier to digitize areas or map areas in the city rather than in rural or remote areas. So that, that makes a little bit, um, the, the map is, is less homogeneous in that way. Um, now in terms of positional accuracy, um, errors in the form of, of RMSE or geometric, geometric match from uh, either junctions or line features uh, have been calculated against uh, authoritative or proprietary or official data sets. And so in this respect, the results were, were not conclusive and sometimes they were uh, different among each other. Uh, it's, it was a case by case, basically. And, um, and similar to completeness, higher accuracy levels were found around urban areas. Um, um, there are other authors that have been looking at, at these two um, data quality aspects uh, from other standpoints. Instead of comparing with other data sets, they were using alternative measures. Uh, and um, uh, for example, um, the, the historic database in OSM. OSM has the, uh, the possibility of looking at all the features uh, from its creation date until the current the current status or its current state. So it is possible to track down all the edits, all the users, all the history behind the features. And that is very powerful. So um, there in it and other other authors have been using this um, these methods to also develop ways to to assess the quality. Um, Completeness was assessed by looking at the trends of, of road length across time. So the higher the variability of the trends, the higher the expectation to more changes or additions in the future. Um, and the proxy for positional accuracy was a change of position of junctions measured by degrees and distance between the current status and the previous edit. So this means that uh, if, if editors or um, or modifiers or correctors would uh, change a lot the features or the geometry, then that that would mean that um, that feature has been corrected. And so if, if the trend is, 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 is stabilizes uh, on the aggregate, that could be an indication that the data set is more or less complete or more or less reliable. Uh, and also it's um, when, that way, it, uh, for them, it was also easy to identify bulk uploads uh, similar to, uh, to what well, we found some uh, also as well in our studies. Uh, but so um, they, they were also able to, to pinpoint those, those cases. Um, then uh, we also found another um, 
another way to to kind of estimate data quality, and this was uh, by uh, 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 also Baron uh, and others who uh, who were able to uh, to measure trustworthiness by combining or by creating an index of um, of trust, and they were building this score based on number of versions, number of contributors type of user, um, a volume of, of the data um, uploaded, et cetera. Uh, this was interesting, and we also try to uh, take parts of this in our analysis, but uh, unfortunately, it didn't hold in our case. Um, at the end, we did not find any evidence of predicting missing growth through spatial regressions or classification methods, which, which was our kind of our main uh, idea. So our strategy was uh, to develop a series of test diagnostics that could give us a sense of the overall accuracy and completeness of growth features in OSM. And this was uh, also with the premise of, of integrating and manipulating all these data within a GIS environment. Uh, as a case study, we used four West African countries, Guinea, Ghana, Liberia, and Senegal. Uh, we were also kind of not really uh, focused on this, but we wanted to see whether there was a difference uh, with countries that have experienced a, an important crisis such as Ebola uh, in Guinea, Liberia versus Ghana and Senegal. We were not really testing this, but we wanted just to see. Um, in terms of data inputs, so we didn't we don't have we didn't have a benchmark for these countries. So we wanted to to see whether we could use other data sets as predictors or as um, as data inputs that would help us um, uh, estimate uh, the completeness and, and uh, well, accuracy was not really just with this, uh, but uh, completeness of, of OSM growth. And we used um, populations from GPW, uh, the global population of the world, version four, also hosted at season, uh, relative wealth, which is an, an index measure from DHS, um, the Demographic and Health Survey, uh, all countries were circa 2012, 2010, more or less. GBW was from 2012 uh, round census, so this could vary between 2010, 2013. And populating places, uh, this is point data from geonames.org. Um, then for our roads, um, we downloaded from OSM. Uh, in October 5th, 2015. So this means that the results that we'll <laughs> present today may not hold now because OSM changes so rapidly. Um, it may all be different. Um, our unit of analysis is a, a, the administrative level two, um, and this was part of the limitation of, of this analysis. So for positional accuracy, we're going to um, well, we thought of calculating RMSC against rulers uh, as our ground truth, and we did this in randomly selected junctions um, and randomly selected areas, controlling for urban and rural classification based on the literature we decided to do this. Uh, and then in terms of completeness, uh, we wanted to, to see whether these three methods could give us more or less an indication of, of how how well is OSM growth in terms of coverage. Um, first is, is a method that we call this quick qualification. Second is spatial regression. And then third is the connecting setup. So for positional accuracy, our results uh, were pretty, pretty, pretty well. Um, so the error, the root, uh, the root mean squared error in all four cases is below 50 meters. Uh, which is really great. Uh, for Global Growth version one, we had this target and not all the countries of Portugal met this target. Uh, in this case, OSM uh, roads for all our four countries uh, really met or were below this uh, benchmark. In three out of four occasions, I mean, this, this doesn't have any statistical power, but it's um, it's just a way to show that there is um, there is a chance that we can find 
countries with pre 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 accurate data. And again, we were only measuring junctions. We were not measuring geometries of lines or other uh, features that you know, other authors have have made better than us. Uh, we were just you know wondering about junctions. And so we found that in general, between urban and rural, uh, all our three countries were below 15 meters, which could potentially be, um, um, so it, it's, it's really positive. Uh, I don't know if this is gonna be the new target for global growth version two, but we'll see. Uh, okay, so this was positional accuracy that, that was checked, that was perfect, so now let's go to completeness. And the first thing that we thought was to develop a method that would tell us something about the extreme. So in general, uh, what we thought was, okay, we have road densities in one hand, and let's see all these areas, um, so at least level two areas, with relative lower road density, so areas that had uh, road density below the median. Um, and then look at areas with population density and relative wealth above the median. So the intuition is that you will have more people, you will have relative more wealth. Uh, that could lead us to, uh, to think about areas with more roads. If we find uh, the former conditions without roads, then that means that we can find areas that are potentially missing roads. So we match these two conditions and flag those areas that uh, were kind of indicative or of potentially missing roads. In the case of Liberia, we can see that the areas are flagged in red. Uh, so the southeast and uh, one admin units in the north uh, are highlighted. And then uh, for Yana, some units in the middle, in the east, for Guinea, some, some units there in, uh, I'm gonna use this pencil, here, and then Senegal, you can see here. Uh, so, so we observed areas with missing roads in all flat community rulers, and we were able to confirm all of those, so this was great news because then it means that, yeah, our classification method worked, but also we noticed areas with missing roads that were not black, and this was bad news because then it means that our method worked for, for extremes, but not really for all, all cases. So it's a pretty conservative method. Uh, we went back to, to the OSM road, uh, the, the vector features, and we started to look at the different aspects of, um, of class and, um, and areas, et cetera. And then we started noticing these this things. So as you can see, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty clear that, you know, a volunteer took a tile, digitized this area, but forgot to perhaps look at this area or look at this area. Um, so if we follow the principle of Tobler's uh, first law geography that everything is related to everything else but closer things more do so, then we could expect more roads next to areas with high road density. So the areas that, that our volunteer mapper forgot to look at here, perhaps these are areas that we could uh, predict as missing based on our two other inputs. Um, so we decided to test the spatial regression models. Um, we tested many spatial models. We tested many combinations, many, uh, sorry, many different um, uh, weighting schemes in terms of spatial, spatial matrices, or weighting matrices. Uh, and, um, the, the one that worked best and, and uh, had the best fit was the Durban model. Um, and um, our, our continu continuity matrix uh, was the uh, queen and um, our last 
special I was uh, only one. And so, for example, in Liberia, uh, the same case that we were looking at before. Um, so the area that I was highlighting before is about this around this area. And yeah, so maybe our our results in, in terms of, of the spatial regression, um, they are they are providing uh, more or less um, a good results. Now they are highlighting the areas that, that were not picked by discrete classification and uh, that we observed that were that were missing. Uh, in red are the high, the areas with highest prediction with respect to current growth status. And in pink are the areas with some predictive road missing. It's, what this means is that all the areas that I highlighted either in pink or red are, are areas that the model predicted that could have missing roads, but the areas that highlighted in red are the ones that are in the, in the top, in the extreme level. So those are the ones that we are really, really interested in. Um, so the, the spatial model, the Derby model, um, was able to pick more more areas there, and then we started to look at so compare again with with the discrete classification method as also validation of our previous uh, method. And yeah, so it could be right that these two areas are related, and our regression method method is is picking them up. And yeah, so that's, that's also great. But then uh, we started to, to again, validate these results against Google Earth, right? Because Google Earth, which we are taking Google Earth as our ground truth uh, based on, on, on uh, work done. Also, it has been published, like Google Earth could, could be used as, uh, uh, for this purpose. Uh, so, uh, we're looking at these areas, and, and then we started to realize that we have a lot of false positives. In the case of Ghana, we have 43%. That was not great. Um, in terms of Guinea, we have 11% uh, false positives. And Liberia, we have up to 30%. So yeah, um, we augmented our, our areas of potential meeting roads, but then we also Increase the areas of 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 picking other 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 methods, other um, situations, other conditions uh, created more errors. In the case of Senegal, uh, there were zero percent false positive units, but in this case, as you can see, the admin level unit two in Senegal doesn't work for this type of analysis. The area unit is too big and uh, that distorts a lot of the response. Okay, so then as a third method, we said, okay, let's see if, if by, um, with our third method, we could conclude something about all this. Um, so what we did here was take geonames point data and um, estimate the nearest growth feature to the point in the sense that uh, if the point data is kind of matching a settlement and roads connect settlements, then it means that all roads need to be near the point. And um, we establish radius, uh, uh, like different radius to the settlement point, and we tested one kilometer, 2.5, 5, and 10. And as we go further away the settlement, it would mean that um, areas without roads would be left out, no? So, um, so yeah, so we use geonames.org, uh, input data to test this. Uh, we, we, we did um, uh, <clears throat> uh, a near, near feature um, test. And then we can see clearly that there are patterns here, areas that are unconnected. We, we validate this against Google Earth, and then again we found that, yeah, this method is pick, picking it up really well. So the gaps are really well identified in Google Earth. Uh, so the conclusion, and it's like a working process, it's like a, 
uh, temporary conclusion. Yeah, so you know for countries, the positional accuracy of all assemblies is within an acceptable range, so that's check. Uh, in terms of completeness, there is no one method that gives an absolute and credible result of our road coverage in the country, but the combination of the three can give us a, a pretty good idea. So in terms of Guinea, we have we have more or less uh, here, here, and here, and then some areas here and here. So we have more more uh, uh, correspondence to our results. There are a lot of limitations. Uh, we have the modifiable aerial unit problem. The quality of data input, uh, geo names is not great. Uh, we're going to use geo survey from axis as the next step. The cut of values, we are perhaps we are not we are not doing it good for extremes or uh, at, you know the difference between pink and red. Maybe we need to modify that so that we can highlight areas more um, the areas that really matter, having less errors, among many other many other uh, types of limitations. So I'm going to leave it like there. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paula. I'm, I'm pretty impressed by um, your live annotation of your slides where, while you were presenting. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, we, ha <laughs> we have um, a number of pending questions, um, and I will start with the first one I missed from Rama. Uh, Rama is from uh, the NASA ESIS project, and he's asking specifically, Mikhail, on who does the quality assurance and who resolves disputes, if any, appear? Sure. Well, in, in normal, you know, everyday circumstances, 99% of the time, um, QA is, a, um, uh, is done by other members of the community. So there's no um, distinct QA step. You edit, it goes into OpenStreetMap, but there are other people in the community who are Using various tools like uh, like the ones that I showed um, to um, check on things. There's also in the tools themselves there are um, val there is a uh, automated validation. Um, it, there's an editor called uh, JASM, Java OpenStreetMap editor, and it has built-in validation that runs a number of checks. So you can do that as a mapper, but it's not a, it's not enforced. It's um, you know it's up to you to decide that high quality data is important. Um, it works. Um, but of course, there are that you know maybe 0.01% of the time where um, there's a disagreement, there's a dispute, and um, that often that could take the um, the form of a dispute over a place name. Um, that happens frequently, and when um, we have a few like rules of thumb uh, to work these things out. Um, but if it can, if the community cannot come to a consensus about how to map something. Then the OpenStreetMap Foundation has a working group called the Data Working Group, which is charged with mediating in these disputes and, um, if needed, making uh, making a call on what should be there and then enforcing it. This is a group with a, a little bit of extra power um, at the system administrator access, but they use it extremely sparingly. Um, so. Compared to say Wikipedia, where there's where moderators and various levels of admins have to be very active in making sure that disputes are taken care of, it actually, um, by and large, um, very seldomly bubbles up to that level within OpenStreetMap. Thanks, Michael. Um, a personal question here: uh, When it comes to disputes involving um, sovereignty claims between countries. Um, did, did you have to face such issues in OpenStreetMap? Yeah, sure. I, so I, there's two things. One, um, you know, of course, we're not going to be in, in in the business of resolving um, ultimately uh, political disputes over boundaries. But like any mapping system, we do we do hear about these things when they they come up. So. Um, one, we have the on the ground rule, which is basically if if there's if you were on the ground in that place and you were trying to get around, um, what would you need to know um, in order to to get around? And that that's sort of a guidance for like that's that's what should be in the map. So I guess it, in in some sense it, it comes down to um, into local control. Um, 
but the other thing to note is that everything in OpenStreetMap is, is localizable. So you can localize um, place names to any number of languages. You can also localize boundaries. You can mark boundaries as disputed. Um, so the system for representing data in OpenStreetMap is very flexible and expandable. And um, <clears throat> for instance, we have a team in, in India, and um, in India has various border disputes. And when the team makes maps in India, they need to show the map as it is uh, expected by um, the Indian government. And you can do that with OpenStreetMap data because different perspectives are all represented within the data, and you can extract the version for um, into your GIS or into your um, map design software uh, that you want to use, um, and likewise for for anyone else. So um, I guess in short, we don't attempt to resolve those things, but allow for all points of view to be to be present in the map. Thanks, Mika. Certainly a, a delicate question. We have another question from Asti Padang Yudono. I hope I did not spell your name from University of Sheffield. Is there any potential collaboration between OpenStreetMap as an OGC member with spatial data infrastructure, SDI, in a particular country? I guess this is from Mikhail. Sure. Um, well, any the way the OpenStreetMap re represents its data is in a is in a, a unique way, which is particularly suited for. Uh, managing revisions and being easy to integrate into other software tools. But you can easily take OpenStreetMap data and um, transform it into OGC compatible formats. There's lots of services and pieces of software which do that. Um, as far as that collaboration um, with folks involved with SDI, um, I think it depends on the country. Uh, one thing I've recently gotten involved with at the UN level. There's a, a group of geographic information, uh, UNGGIM, which consists of, there's a working group on disaster response. It consists of members of national mapping agencies from countries around the world, as well as um, a few invited guests, like humanitarian open street map team and uh, map action. and. I think um, there's two things there. One, we want to make sure that OpenStreetMap data can easily be integrated into other systems and certainly making sure that everyone is aware how easy it is to bring it into OGC compatible formats and software um, is a big part of that. The other thing is, I think, as a, maybe a bit more inspiration, um, I, I truly believe that um, if that combination of open data as well as a collaborative environment creates really great geographic data. And when you're talking about an SDI, certainly it can't be as open as OpenStreetMap, but I think there's within the community of folks, of entities in a country contributing to an SDI, a um, community that works in a similar way to OpenStreetMap with a lot of transparency among themselves and a collaborative environment can be very productive for moving the, the aims and mission of uh, spatial data infrastructure forward. Thanks, Mikhail. We have another question from Joan Aron. Um, I don't know where uh, Joan is from, but he's still in the company, uh, the organization field. So his question is, how do the uses of road data affect the validation approach for data quality? For example, census and emergency responders have different needs. Uh, yeah, so we do not discriminate the, the validation approach uh, for different users. I know that they, like for example, emergency response um, would need like more um, more accuracy in order to plan for, for their activities. Uh, in our case, it, this is more like the scale is, tends to be global, so we are not discriminating against this. Right. Okay. Um, another question for you, Paola from Rama. Um, how do you measure errors in places where you don't have base maps to compare with? 
Are there field surveys of sampled set of locations? No, so the errors were uh, basically measured against Google Earth. That was our ground truth. So exactly, because we don't have any field data for different countries that we would like to conduct this assessment uh, to subsequently. So we needed it's something that could be applied to all countries uh, uh, the same. So we, we went to Google Earth. And we, I'm, I'm looking here at a, a question from Marco Minghini. Uh, in terms of position accuracy from Google Earth and the reliability, yes. So we are aware that uh, this is not the best um, tool that we have, but it's kind of like so the, something is so it's something. So we tested also edge imagery. We tested uh, many other uh, pieces of imagery that we have around, and uh, Google Earth seems to work best for us. It's not perfect, but <laughs> was the best option. Right. So you answered two questions, uh, Paula. Thanks. There's another one yeah. from Suti Kumar. Um, can the use of ARIMA, autoregressive integrated moving average model, be used for prediction? Could be. I am not familiar with this model. Thanks for suggesting it. So I will look at it and see if 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 it can it can apply to our um, our study. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Um, there's another question from Adi Pandan, you don't know. Um, from the three assessment approaches you use, which is the best approach to assess completeness of OSM data? We, we, can, we, don't, we are not conclusive on this point. We, I think that what we would ultimately do is that uh, we have uh, automated this process to, to run this um, you know, in our so that we don't need to we don't need to spend a lot of time uh, country by country. Uh, I think that what we will ultimately do is run this again uh, in other countries, uh, in other places, and see what the results are. And based on on that, then we will go from there. I don't I don't see that we will pick one method necessarily because. The three have very different assumptions and very different approaches. Um, so they are showing different things, and it depends a lot on the data input. In the case of settlements, uh, the classification one is, is very conservative. So I don't, I don't think that we are going to pick one. I think it's it's going to be the results from the three, and then uh, make a decision out of that. Thanks, Paola. I've just noticed that Kuti Kumar um, would like to have your email address for, um, to follow up on his question. So if you would like to share it with him, could you do that through the chat window? Sure. If, okay, thanks. Um, let's uh, continue with um, a follow-up question from Marco. Which was the criterion adopted for sampling the road intersection? Uh, sorry, the how did uh, which which was the criterion adopted for sampling the road intersection? Okay, so this was random samples. So we extracted all the junctions in uh, in R, and then from that list we ran a sample, a random sample, uh, based uh, well we first differentiated. Uh, urban rural uh, areas, and then afterwards, uh, we then, um, a, based on the distribution of population and the the urban um, proportion from uh, from the UN population division, then we we set up a, a proportion for countries. So, for example, you know, this was a general thing. So, if we say I don't know, uh, Mexico is 52% urban and 48% rural, then we apply this proportion to our areas, and then um, we, uh, we then sampled from using that proportion uh, as a base, we used 100 points for each country. We tested this before, and that number seemed to work best. 
Okay, thanks very much, Paula. Thanks, Paula and, and Michael. We have one final question, and I think it's a, a perfect question to uh, as a last question <laughs> um, from Tyler Radford. He thanks he's thanking both of you for your presentation, and he's asking what's next for your team, um, and more specifically, how difficult is it to apply your model to other countries? Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team would love to apply this to Indonesia, where we've been working for four years now, where he has been working for four years now. Any reactions to this final question from both of you? Yes, I would be happy to test Indonesia. Yeah, why not? Thank you for suggesting this. I think it's a great Any idea. <laughs> so, yeah. I'd, I'd love to. I'd love to discuss more. I think, especially the um, comparison um, against uh, population and other measures. If we can find a reproducible way to apply this to other other countries in OpenStreetMap, would be super valuable for HOT and for others. So I, um, I glad that uh, to connect with Paula through the webinar, um, and I hope we get a chance to talk more again. Excellent. Thank you, Mikael. Thank you, Paula. I think we've uh, reached the hour now, so we have to conclude. Uh, thanks for these fascinating presentations. The material for this webinar, the recording, and the slides of the presenters, if they, uh, if they agree, will be made available on the World Data System website on the webinar page, and you will receive an email with the link to access uh, the material. So again, very thank you very much, Mikael and Paola, for your time and efforts to, to prepare these presentations. And uh, please stay tuned for the next webinar in the World Data System webinar series. Thank you. Goodbye, Mikael. Thanks, and everyone. Goodbye, Paola. <laughs> thank you. Thank goodbye. you very much. Okay. Good, goodbye. <laughs> All right.